third participant or contributor to this paper, Chris Dolson, who contributed some of the text and images but can't be here today. Um, this, this session is about division and fragmentation in archaeology and how we can reconnect ourselves. But of course, this isn't a new um, problem, as this next slide um, from the 1970s shows that after antiquity rescue archaeology research or rubbish collection, there was quite a you know quite a big divisive uh, <coughs> debate at that time. Um, so this isn't a new a new problem. But the advent of PPG 16 in 1990 um, did bring different kinds of divisions. Um, and these were primarily organisational and structural, deriving from the polluter pays model, which led to a new division of roles, those of curator, contractor and consultant, lots of meetings. Um, and those structural divides were then reflected in spatial separation of places of work. Because in the old days, a unit based in a single office kind of did everything on its own patch. But now curator, contractor, consultant may be geographically distant from each other, which I think probably compounds the effects of structural separation. Um, the present system also disconnects us from the public. Um, the formalities of the planning system, severe pressures on local authority archaeologists, commercial imperatives, and of course health and safety, make it difficult for development-led archaeology to embrace the general public. And even though the system uh, was created in the public interest and is meant to produce public benefit, the public may feel that they're not getting much benefit, and even quite you know, knowledgeable local people, local volunteers, can feel excluded from it. And to some extent, this fragmentation is a result of the profession being much larger than it was and doing much more archaeology, which is good. Um, and it also reflects the commercial system which we have. Now, views on how desirable that system is uh, may differ, but it's what we've got and it isn't likely to change anytime soon. So what can help us to bind us together in the face of all of these forces? Um, well, uh, uh, it's an obvious point, this, but I think it's worth saying, an interest in archaeology already does that. When we meet at a conference, say, where we're discussing prehistory, organisational differences tend to be put aside because, in the end, we're all interested in the same stuff and the same subject. Um, I say that it does seem rather obvious, but it's worth reminding us of our, ourselves of it. And, of course, this community of interest is enshrined in CETA, under whose auspices we were meeting. And actually, it's, it's an easy point to lose sight of. And Jill pointed out in the discussion in 21st Century Challenges yesterday that Nowhere in the 21st century challenges, and this isn't the criticism of that great work, did it actually talk about the challenge of studying the past and investigating the past and making it kind of interesting. Um, so there is a, you know, we need to keep sight of what we're, you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but to be more specific, in this paper, we want to argue that place is something which can help to bind us together. Um, uh, over the past uh, quarter century or more, there's been a great deal of interest in the concept of place the philosophy of place, um, especially on the part of cultural geographers, the relevance of place to policy, and the practice by architects, designers, uh, urban designers, landscape architects, and others of uh, uh, what, what they refer to as placemaking. And we can cite, for example, Dolores Hayden's uh, influential book, uh, 1995 book from the United States, The Power of Place, the title of which was then borrowed um, for our own review of historic environment policies in 2000. And the notion of place was echoed in the ministerial foreword to the NPPF in 2012 in terms which have quite interesting implications uh, for the theme of this session and this talk. Enhance and improve the places in which we live our lives should be a collective enterprise. Planning has tended to exclude. They're all themes that are sort of familiar to us in our world uh, and, and seem to have a wider resonance. Um, and there are also many examples of large-scale development proposals which, put us, which are putting a strong emphasis on the idea of creating places, places with a clear character and identity, rather than building uh, things. Uh, here's one example from many that one could choose, a sort of master planning document for the new settlement at Ed Street in Kent. And one of their themes is to celebrate, reflect the landscape, people, and cultural heritage. And there is actually, in the small print, uh, refers to a range of archaeological industrial and industrial features that define the uniqueness of this area. And of course, the elephant that we saw at the beginning was one of those things that excavated by Oxford Archaeology on the route of HS1. And no doubt when um, this settlement takes shape, I'm sure at some point the elephant will come to feature in the identity and the public art of that new settlement. Um, so archaeology, history, landscape, cultural heritage can be can come to be seen as very important sources for that creative endeavor of placemaking. Um, there is, I mean, it follows from this, really, there's a time dimension to place. Place, place and places aren't fixed, but they're always in the process of becoming. 
partly through new daily forms of activity and physical changes, but potentially also through the investigation of a place's past. Archaeologists can be part of the creation of place. Um, places exist in the present, but they're shaped by their past. Um, people construct a sense of place today through the activities of work and leisure uh, that they do there. And this moulds any sense of how a place might have been in the past. Um, uh, we've got two contrasting examples of the same kind of monument, Roman temples. Um, one in the back of an industrial estate in Harlow. Um, the temple is, is there, and that's looking, uh, the view looking away from the industrial estate, but if you looked in the other direction, you'd see some big sheds. Um, so that's a Roman temple in one context, and then uh, one in Greenfields, um, under excavation near Marcham in Oxfordshire. Um, so those would be very different perceptions of the past, and also may offer more you know, different kinds of possibilities for investigation and analysis, depending on the context. And the nature of present-day communities also affects the perceptions of the past. The mix of class, ethnicity, and local engagement in a place in the present will help to create different pasts or different perceptions of the past in those places. So place is important as a concept and as a practice, if you like, but how can it help to bind us as archaeologists together to, to reconnect us? Well, in the end, archaeological work is all geographically specific, or fieldwork at least. It's based on what exists or what is found in particular places. In fact, it goes beyond fieldwork, it's all archaeological work. I think. So an interest in place and places is central to the work of all of us. And this interest, uh, we say, can serve to articulate relationships between us because it is a shared interest. Um, for curators, an emphasis on place is perhaps the most obvious. They and the planning system as a whole are very much concerned with place, so much so that some local authority planning services, it may be some of uh, the ones that you work for, all I know, um, actually have the word place in their title now. Um, curators are part of the place-making process as part of the planning system, and they're also linked by the democratic arrangements for local planning to the people who inhabit these places. So they have a very obvious local focus. Equally, archaeological contractors work, often intensively, in specific locations. Indeed, they may devote many hundreds or even thousands of person hours to the very detailed examination and study of the archaeology of a particular place. Um, sometimes this will be a long-term engagement with an, with an organisation carrying out multiple ex investigations over a period of many years. Um, but because of the competitive system we have, there's also the possibility of fragmentation in relation to particular places. Different organisations may work on different sites, even adjacent ones in the same place or area, but in relative isolation from each other. And uh, this slide is, is uh, a map of some work that uh, Wendy Morrison and Chris Dawson and I did. The study area is the Upper Thames Valley between um, sort of Lechlade and Sirencester. Um, 63 different organisations had worked in that area. A quite a large portion of the work was done by um, a smaller number, it's still a very diverse picture, and in some cases, um, the same organisation, uh, or, or the same area being investigated, adjacent plots of it by different organisations. Um, quite a good example of the need to reconnect, which was what this project was about, trying to gather all that data together. So a sharper focus on the importance of whole places might be one way of reconnecting ourselves. Um, equally, uh, consultants are working on place-specific archaeological projects, and they may also be working with the planning of place as part of multidisciplinary design teams working out proposals and documents like the one we saw earlier for Ebbsfleet for large-scale new development. And what about academia in all of this? Um, how, does, uh, the, how does that fit into the picture? Of course, some important aspects of the academic base are very obviously not tied closely to place, theoretical frameworks for archaeology or the overall interpretative schemes within which we work. Many and most probably academics, though, do do field work, which necessarily locates them in specific places. Um, furthermore, all academic departments have some local knowledge and engagement, which in turn links academics with other local archaeologists, both professional and voluntary. But more particularly, a number of universities are now carrying out projects which connect strongly with local communities. And Oxford University has had a series of local research projects, including the excavation of hill forts along the Ridgeway, that's Uppington Castle, several others, the White Horse in uh, Oxfordshire, several others hill forts were investigated. And then 11 years of excavation at Marcham, the site of the Roman temple, which we saw earlier, Iron Age and Roman sacred site. Um, 
And in both those projects, totaling 20 years of work, the university engaged with a series of local communities. Um, and for the last decade, Oxford Archaeology and the university have collaborated in digging at Dorchester on Thames, uh, mainly Roman material, but with some Iron Age, and important excavations of the, of the Neolithic Cursus, um, most of which was destroyed by gravel digging in the uh, 50s, but a little bit is still left, and Jill and her colleagues investigated that. And this project, again, has involved local people, partly through the small and volunteer-run Dorchester Museum, but also a range of individual um, links. Um, the university has also carried out a large project in East Oxford, led by David Griffiths from the Continuing Education Department, with Heritage Lottery funding and with some engagement from OA. And that project was a very interesting one. It involved engaging members of East Oxford's very diverse and, in some cases, disadvantaged communities in fieldwork and research on the actually very rich archaeology of the rather neglected eastern suburban hinterland of the historic city centre, an area which, in comparison to the city centre, had been rather um, overlooked in the past. And it was a you know, very successful project and created a kind of community of local people who were interested in their past. Um, other universities are available. Um, <laughs> University of Cambridge, similarly, has um, uh, its currently so-called currently occupied rural settlements cause project, um, which engaged diverse audiences, including school children, in a programme of test pitting in a number of East Anglian villages. And again, that was very influential and engaged um, large numbers of people. And so these projects have all linked academic archaeologists and professionals to places and the people who live in them. Um, and with the present emphasis in academia on impact and public engagement in research and various difficulties in working abroad in some parts of the world now, I think this approach is, is only likely to become more common in the future. Um, and finally, but actually most importantly, what about people and communities? Um, place and places only really exist because of the presence of people. We say things like the whole turn town that turned out to watch. Well, actually, the idea of a place and its inhabitants are kind of completely inseparable. Um, and so, and for that reason, people tend to be very interested in their specific places, the places they live in, work in, or visit. And I think even people who may not be especially interested in archaeology in general may be very interested to know what's been found in their specific patch, because it tells them something new about their surroundings. So a focus on place may give us a vehicle for reconnecting both within our profession and more widely with the public in whose name and ultimately at whose expense our work is done. And we'd like to cite two specific examples of how this might work or how it is working. And the first is Didcot in South Oxfordshire, maybe best known to you for its cooling towers and now partially demolished power station that you see from the railway. Um, but 20 years ago, it was a small, fairly sleepy railway town, but it's been growing exponentially since then. And it's now been designated as a garden town under the government's plan to get more houses built. And excavations by a plethora of archaeological groups through a variety of developers, has demonstrated the importance of this place in prehistory and the Roman period. Really, very little was known about it before, but now you've got this um, large number and some very extensive excavations across the area. Um, some of these discovers, discoveries have been published, and the, the results of others are still uh, harder to find. Um, some of the discoveries are exceptional, and others are pretty uh, you know, more mundane. But how can we get the best out of future archaeological endeavour in an area like this without unnecessarily repeating the excavation of the kinds of things that we all already come to understand quite well in those places. Strategic developments um, like these, and this was, the, sorry, that slide was an evaluation, the, um, the captured on Google Earth, you can't get away with it, um, but there are the kind of things. I think the evaluation was done by one organisation and then the, the main excavation by another, so again, another need for reconnection. Quite interesting how many evaluations you can see on Google Earth these days if you look around. Um, yeah, strategic developments like these provide excellent opportunities to work together and to create sort of place focused research frameworks to deliver more meaningful archaeological investigation targeted on the specifics of a place like that rather than just a shopping list or generalities. Um, and this, in fact, this idea was picked up in the 21st Century Challenges where Barney referred to the possibility of uh, sort of taking a more strategic approach to large-scale development areas like this, um, which are being delivered for a, a, a variety of developers. It's not a single developer like on HS2, but it is a single area that's being developed. Um, and doing that would enable diverse groups to sort of share in and shape the research endeavour 
focus on what it is that we think we want to know about Didcot or wherever it is, and to create a new historical narrative of that place. Um, and as well as being of specialised important archaeological interest, this is potentially extremely important to placemaking and the creation of new community identities. Always a challenge when literally thousands of new homes are being built in a short space of time on what was previously open countryside, as is the case here. And the potential contribution of archaeology to placemaking and community identity is very well demonstrated at Amesbury, where the famous Amesbury Archer has um, inspired both public art and given his name to the new uh, primary school with its um, motto, Aim High. Um, you may like that, you may not, but that's what they've chosen. Um, and that's a very dramatic picture of the, uh, of the sculpture that was created of the Amesbury Archer, but the next shot shows it in slightly less uh, dramatic context in front of a charity shop, but nonetheless shows that it's actually very much part of the local, the local community and the local everyday scene. And that, you know, that's had a big impact on the identity of that, that big new house in the estate of Amesbury. Um, our, second, our second example um, is the recent work that's taking place around Camborne near Cambridge, <coughs> a, new, <coughs> excuse me, a new town that's set to double in the next few years and become one of the largest uh, settlements in Cambridgeshire. An evaluation in the area around Camborne Village College in 2015 enabled the students to take part in an archaeology workshop and guided tour, and inspired by their visit, they formed an after-school archaeology club which led to an HLF-funded project last year with Oxford Archaeology East as Heritage Partners, in which 20 or 25 members of the club opened up an area adjacent to the school which had been earmarked for future development but wasn't needed um, in the short term, so it was available for excavation. And for a week and a weekend, they hand-excavated Iron Age Roundhouse and other Iron Age and Vermont British remains, which they recorded and drew, discovering something about what it was like to live in their village 2,000 years ago. And there were workshops and assemblies, as well as visits for other students, and a very successful open day at which local families could find out about the early history of Camborne for the first time. And Camborne Parish Council are considering using archaeology as a theme of their celebrations in 2019 of the first residents moving into the town, and an HLF grant is being sought to expand this work, including a GIS map for residents to show them what lay beneath their house or street uh, which is no longer visible but can still uh, inform their view of the place, helping to generate a sense of community in this new and growing settlement. So to start drawing the threads together, um, we'd suggest that fo a focus on place can help uh, in a number of ways to reconnect us. Um, as we said, a significant proportion of development and development of archaeology is currently concentrated in a restricted number of locations, often the peripheries of existing towns, such as Didcot, or the, or the sites of major new settlements, such as Camborne, which have been designated as major housing areas. And these have this consistent pattern of very large-scale house building carried out through a number of different developers. So there is a need to reconnect. Um, and for that reason, in those areas, you may well have a number of different archaeological contractors operating and so these do seem to be natural arenas for collaboration and connecting with a sharpened focus on the archaeology of the specific place of the specific place as the binder which can bring us together in a common enterprise. Um, such reconnection might also invigorate our archaeological work and thought. Um, my impression at least, and I'm interested if other people disagree with this, is that in at least some parts of the country the basic repertoire of archaeological site types is, is now quite well established and in some cases becoming quite predictable or even repetitive. So oh yes, it's another Bronze Age ring ditch or Neolithic pit or Romana British rural settlement. Not that different in, in broad terms from, from the last one. Um, but different places and areas are distinguished from each other by having very varying combinations in which these different site types occur. Some areas, you know, we all know this sort of instinctively as it were, some areas have lots of Neolithic and early Bronze Age material. Others have very less, less, little, much less, and don't seem to have been really occupied much before, say, the Iron Age. Um, some areas have very little early Saxon material. Others have much more, and so on. And the later landscapes, that's to say medieval onwards, are also locally and regionally distinctive. And I think a focus on these different local trajectories and archaeological sequences should encourage comparison and contrast and move us beyond simply investigating individual sites to taking a wider place-based and area-based view. And this could be a strong force for reconnection. Um, different contractors may be working on adjacent or comparable sites in a local area. 
Curators obviously have an overview of their area. Academia may be able to provide synthesis and context, and all of this in areas which may be seeing you know, unparalleled uh, intensity of archaeological investigation and new discoveries at the moment. And as part of this, and as, as we were saying before, um, initiatives to create sort of local or sub-regional syntheses and local research frameworks or agendas, much more specific than the, than the necessarily generalised regional ones, could help to bring together our different tribes around the same table, discussing things of common interest, what we know about a place from our joint endeavours, what we would like to find out about it. NPPF requires us to focus on advancing understanding, and this requires us to learn from previous work, to generate new models from the information we've already recovered, and to test these. But this does rely on active communication taking place between everybody who's involved in these things. And finally, and even more importantly, to echo what I was saying before, um, this focus on place could help us to link more closely to local communities, whether long-established ones or ones that are the result of new development, and enable us to contribute collectively to shaping the identities of new places. There are many ways in which archaeology could do this, and we've talked about some of them. But I think they're all likely to depend, in the end, on the combined capacity and ability of us as archaeologists to tell compelling stories about the places we work on. And that's, only, that's likely to require reconnecting ourselves so you get a full story. Place involves a complex series of contemporary relationships, people who live and work in an area and who may have views about what is important about its past, the various species of archaeologists, curatorial, commercial, academic, and people who've just moved into an area, a new housing estate, say, and, and who may be looking for a sense of community, identity, and place in their new home. Um, archaeologists and what archaeologists have to contribute are potentially an important part of these networks of relationships. The lives and relationships of all of us are always mediated by the specifics of place. Now, it's unlikely that there are any panaceas for the problem of disconnection in archaeology, and in fact, the aim of this session is to debate a wide range of possible different ways in which this important issue could be addressed. Um, but our own contribution today uh, has been to argue that because of the geographically specific nature of archaeology, and because of the nature of a large part of our work at present, which involves responding archaeologically to the large-scale transformation or creation of new places, a more concerted focus on place and on the study of places as a joint enterprise could be a powerful mechanism for reconnecting with each other. And more than that, and most importantly, in the final slide, it could also reconnect us to the communities and the people, the public, in whose name and interest we do our business and who in the end are paying for us to do it. Thank you very much.